signal to noise. It's a So it's still worth recording. Is what I'm going to say. With this on? It's still worth recording with this on? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, that sounded pretty terrible. And you had the volume really cranked up? It's not sure why. It was about half.
So in this confession, the church reads together. God created humanity upright and perfect. He gave them a righteous law that would have led to life if they had kept it, but have threatened death if they broke it. Yet if they did not remain for long in this position of honor, Satan used the craftiness of the serpent to seduce Eve, who then seduced Adam. Adam acted without any outside compulsion and deliberately transgressed the law of their creation and the command given to them by eating the forbidden fruit. This comes from Genesis 2, where it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat every tree in the garden, but the one tree of knowledge and good evil you shall not eat for in that day that you eat of it you will surely die and as we continue our service today we want to have a time of focus to our missions families that we have and right now I'd like to invite up Carol or Williams please
We'll read that in just a minute. But uh, by way of an introduction, I want to just ask you to imagine a little scenario with me. Just think of some college students. We'll give them names. Uh, Tommy and Sarah. So Tommy's kind of got a thing for Sarah. You know, thinks she's pretty cute. He's wanting to ask her out. Tommy's a college student, you know, and doesn't have a lot of a lot of resources, has to go to the laundromat. And as he shows up to the laundromat with the filthiest clothes he's ever had, he sees her car in the, in the parking lot. And of course, there she is in there, washing her clothes. And the last thing he wants is for her to see his dirty laundry, right? So, Tommy reaches into his bundle of dirty clothes, crams every filthy thing into the largest sweatshirt he's got, carries the sweatshirt in, puts it in the washing machine, and it's start, you know, I put around the quarters and whatnot. And then, you know, an hour goes by, and he's staring at her for an hour or whatever. And then, of course, he moves into the dryer, stares at her for another hour, and then he takes that sweatshirt out of the dryer and brings it back to his room. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think that's an effective way to clean your clothes? Yeah, probably not so much. I'm guessing not much out of that load got cleaned, right? There's a way in which we can seek for, for a clean heart within ourselves. And there's a wrong way. If we're merely concerned with the, what the other, eyes of other people are seeing, then we're probably going to miss out on truly being clean, cleansed. Today we're looking at a psalm where a very familiar character in the Word of God, David, King David, has committed what we would consider to be his most gravely evil, most awful, wicked sin in his entire life. And this is a low point for David. If you know your Bibles, then you probably have already figured out where I'm headed. You see, David sent his army off to war. The scriptures tell us in the time when kings go off to war, David hung back. I'm putting it in my own words. And one day, as he was going for a walk on his balcony, right, he's the king, he's high up on his, his uh, rooftop, and he's just going for a walk, overlooking his kingdom, and there he sees, down on one rooftop, a beautiful young lady, David. Right, right. So, he sees her, he likes what he sees, he goes and he calls for one of his servants, he says, hey, go get her, bring her to my bedroom. So, he meets her in his bedroom. Does what you would imagine would happen. And sends her back home. And sometime later, she sends a message to King David. I'm pregnant. Now there's a particular problem with the whole situation. It's not just the fact that he brought her to his bedroom without even thinking about marrying her. She's already married. And if you don't know, uh, uh, Uriah. Uriah, thank you. Uriah is actually one of David's fighting men. The guys who were listed as like the special forces of David's army. And so David has betrayed the trust of one of his closest men in his army by taking his life into his own bedroom. And now she's pregnant. So what does David do? Well, he hatches a plan to basically send Uriah to the front lines of the, of the fighting, and then for all the surrounding forces to pull back at one, one foul swoop so that Uriah would be surrounded by the enemy and cut down. And that's exactly what happened. The general carried out the order just as David had planned, and now Bathsheba is a widow. And after a short period of mourning, David brings her back, he marries her, and pretends like the whole thing's legit. Oh, this poor woman. Her husband was killed in war. I, the benevolent king, am going to bring her into my household. I'm going to marry her and provide for her. I was such a good guy, right? Until Nathan shows up. Nathan's a prophet. Nathan's sent by God. And Nathan shows up and says, 
hey, uh, king, there's a guy in your kingdom, and he's got like lots of animals, he's a very wealthy man, and he noticed that one of his neighbors, he had this, this one lamb, that's all he had, this one lamb, and he cared for that lamb, he raised it, he fed it himself with his own hands, he loved this one lamb that he had. But the rich man next door who had a whole, I mean, just acres of animals, came and snatched up that lamb, sacrificed it, and fed it to some guests. What should be done, David? And of course, David's response is, off with his head, right? He should be excruciatingly punished. Who is this? And Nathan says the frightening words, you're the man. To David. To which David realizes, uh oh, my sin has found me out. And David, now this is the interesting thing because you would say, okay, so David is um, potentially, there's, there's some disagreement about whether or not David is guilty of rape in this story. Uh, that's possible, that's a possible interpretation. He is the king exerting. A tremendous amount of power and bringing a woman, this could have been rape. We, we don't, you know, uh, so there's that. There's murder, right? There's lying. This is not a, a glorious moment for David, right? This is not throwing the stone and taking down Goliath, right? This is not, uh, I've, I've slayed the, the lion, the bear, and oh my, um, no. No, this is David at his worst. And you might think, well, surely those words that we hear about David being a man after God's own heart, like surely that would all have come to an end in light of this story. And yet what we actually find is that the reason that David is called a man after God's own heart is because every time he sins, he repents. Which is very unlike the many kings that Israel had had. And David sins, sometimes catastrophically, and then repents. And he sins and repents and he sins and repents. Because that's what a man after God's own heart does. A man after God's own heart is not perfect. He's still a sinner. But he repents. A woman after God's own heart is a woman who sees her sin and repents. And in his repentance, he wrote the psalm that is before us today. Most of your Bibles will have a little subscript before the psalm that says, To the fire master, Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. It tells us exactly when this took place. And so in response to this, which by the way, if you imagine the timeline with me, this is not a day when... You know, Bathsheba is taken to, to David's chambers, and the very next day, or in a couple of days, she takes a pregnancy test. Right? It takes some time for her to figure out she's pregnant. And then it takes some time for David to hatch the plan. And then it takes some time for the plan to be executed. And then it takes some time before Nathan shows up. Commentators estimate that David had sat in his sin for months by the time Nathan showed up and he repented. Sometimes our sin is sticky. It sticks to us. It clings to us. And it takes something sharp, something painful to rattle us enough to get us to truly repent. But let's listen to Psalm 51. And if you would, go ahead and stand with me. If you're able. And we're going to read the whole psalm. And I, I'm going to apply a little bit of what I think is appropriate emotion as I read this. Because I, I hope you all can imagine with me the state of mind that David is in as he's writing these words. Praying to God, have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, plot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, 
that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, that the bones that you have broken rejoice. Now hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from the blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bowls will be offered on your altar. Go and take a seat. Heavenly Father, as we enter into the prayer of David as he faced his sin, I pray, Lord, that we would uh, be challenged in our own sin, but that we would also be encouraged that if your grace could meet David in this darkest hour, that you can certainly meet us in ours as well. By your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would apply this word to individual hearts, to do all the things that your word is meant to do, because we know that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So do this, Lord. Do this in our midst, in this time. We pray this in your Holy Spirit, in your holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, there's four things that jump out to me from this text that I think are worth looking at. And the first one is pretty obvious, that sin is serious. Sin is serious. From the very beginning, just as we read from the confession, God said that if you sin, you'd be cut off from him. That sin is a way of choosing ourselves over God, our desires, our will, the things that we want. My way, God, not your way, my way. Sin is serious. But there's something bizarre about the way that David faces the seriousness of his sin. Because I, I don't know if, <laughs> if you got a little stuck on verse 4 like I have, but David has the curious gall to say, against you, you only, have I sinned. What the heck is he talking about? David, you literally murdered a man. Like, what do you mean you only sinned against God? Does David mean that he didn't sin against your eye? You called a married woman into your bedroom. You mean you didn't sin against Bathsheba? No. David absolutely sinned against them. He's not denying that. But what he is doing is he's putting into perspective sin. And you know what's interesting about the Word of God is that I don't think I can recall any place in the Word of God where the gravity of sin is measured by what you did. By the act itself. The gravity of sin is always measured by the person whom you sinned against. And there's all kinds of metaphors for this, right? So if you walk into a car dealership, it could be a used car dealership, and you see some, uh, I don't know, some, I'm trying to think of an old dumpy car. Uh, somebody, somebody shout out some old dumpy car. Oh, yeah. Huh? Pinto. Pinto. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
He's recognizing sinful acts that he has committed out of that nature. And just like David, we may be the people of God, and yet we will sin. And yet, as we will see in a moment, there is grace. How amazing that David says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Meaning, David already had that salvation. He needed the joy of that salvation to be restored to him. He already had it, and yet, still a sinner. Well, let's move on. Because the other thing that we see is not only that sin is serious, but that the guilt that flows out of that sin can be crushing. And guilt is crushing. And when we rightly understand our sin, that guilt is crushing. And when it's not crushing, it's usually an indication that our hearts, our, our calluses on our hearts have grown thicker and thicker. But as we see, David knows precisely what to do with his guilt. And there's a text that I love. It's incredibly important. In 2 Corinthians 7.10. I'll have it on the board. There it is. Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. We have a self-esteem movement in our society that would tell you to never feel bad about yourself, to never feel down about yourself. But the problem is, that's just too simplistic compared to what the Bible has to say. There is a type of grief and guilt that has a godly purpose when in the hands of the Holy Spirit. And then there's a type of guilt and shame and grief that is completely worldly. It will crush you and leave you crushed. The problem is worldly grief is the kind of grief that we can get used to. It's the kind of shame that we can talk ourselves out of and eventually grow enough palaces to just live with it. Whereas Godly grief is meant to lead us to restoration of Him, to repentance. And from that repentance, freedom from the guilt itself. It's guilt that leads you to freedom from guilt. Does that make sense? So, like David, I mean, David had consequences for all of his sin. That's the other interesting thing that's kind of a side note here, but we don't see it in the text. But in the life of David, we know his, his life, when he sinned, God forgave him, and yet there were still lots of consequences in this life, in the life that David lived, the consequences that he made. It's like when a person commits a crime, has to stand before the county judge or whatever, and stand trial for that, but before they even stood trial, they were in jail, waiting trial, and they become a Christian. They meet somebody else in jail, or maybe a chaplain visits them, or something happens, and they hear the gospel, they, they feel cut to the heart, they repent of their sins, they place their faith in Jesus Christ. They're forgiven by God. But there is no assurance that they will stand before a judge, and the judge will say, oh, you became a Christian? Man, that's good news. Uh, go on home. Right? So that that. David had a lot of life consequences that came from bad decisions. But in an ultimate sense, he was forgiven by God. And I'm confident David is now in glory. Well, sin is serious. Guilt is crushing. But grace is pure joy. Grace is pure joy. And you might say, well, is, is the word grace in this text? I don't think so. But you will notice the very the first few verses, David says, Have mercy on you, God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, plot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You see, in this text, there's no hint anywhere that David expects to have to 
figure it out on his own, how to get right with God. Okay, what's the equation, right? I've committed these sins here, so then I've got to do everything in this bucket in order to outdo everything in that bucket and be right with God. There's no hint of that whatsoever, because David even points to the things that you would think of in the Old Testament. It says, for you will not delight, verse 16, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Now, that's a problem in one sense, because the animal sacrifices, like that's the very process by which, you know, sacrifice is made for your sins, right? This is, this is supposed to be the process by which you get right back with God, right? Wait, wait, what do you mean, God? What do you mean if I do all the right Christian stuff? What do you mean if I do all the right spiritual stuff, all the religious stuff? What do you mean if I go to church, if I put money in the, in the offering box or plate or whatever's over there, uh, if, if I sing the songs, if I hug the people, what, God, what do you mean you want to accept that? Well, he does say he won't accept it until after the remedy. The interesting thing is that all of our religious activity that God desires, it's all good. God does desire it. But He desires it as a response to His cleansing work that comes in our lives first. Notice that He says all these things He's asking God to do. Verse 2, wash me. Verse 2, cleanse me. Verse 7, purge me. Verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness. Verse 9, blot out all my iniquities. On and on and on. And I believe the crescendo of the text is create in me a clean heart, O oh God. David knows that no matter how many animals he puts on the altar and blazes it up, no matter how much sacrifice, no matter how many songs he sings, nothing he can do can create a clean heart inside him. All he has is prayer. All he has is honesty before God. I am a wretched sinner. And all he has to do is pour himself out to God, seeking cleansing that only God can provide. And then verse 19, then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, in whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. So let's bring this to 2022. God loves it when you assemble in his house. There's a holy place set aside for his work. God loves it when you come together in fellowship and sing. God loves the things that we do together here. But if any part of you thinks that you're getting more and more favor in his eyes by doing these things, but I plead with you to wake up and realize you need what the only God can do first. So that any of this could actually matter at all. I mean, even us up here. You think that if, I, if I'm not repenting of my sins, if I'm not on my knees pleading for God to forgive me for my active sins that I, Pastor Ken, am committing, do you think that God cares at all or is impressed by the fact that I stand up here? And preach the Bible? Not for a second. Do you think that he's impressed by the, the people who strum the guitar and sing the songs? Like even, even the leaders in the church, God's not impressed in the least bit. But the great news about that is that grace is pure joy because grace is a gift that is given without us ever, ever earning it. Wouldn't you rather have a God that would say, I long for you, my child, to receive a gift, rather than your Heavenly Father saying, I long for you, my child, to earn my love. Grace is pure, pure joy. I want to draw your attention to one other thing in here. David uses these curious words in verse 7, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. I think there's a few things going on with that. I tried to find a picture of a hyssop branch to put up here on the slides. I couldn't find a good one. Uh, but maybe you know kind of what that looks like. But 
I think there's multiple things that are being drawn upon because a hyssop was used in various ways throughout the Old Testament for specific things. For instance, in the Levitical law, it said that a leper who wanted to seek God's miraculous healing, because leprosy is uncurable to this day. To this day, leprosy is considered uncurable. So, um, if a leper wanted to seek God's miraculous healing, he would go to the priest, the priest would slaughter a lamb, put blood, the blood of the lamb onto a hyssop branch, and then sprinkle it on the leper like four times or seven times or something. Now that's weird, right? <laughs> that's super weird. But uh, th this was like a process that God asked people to do by faith, to come to the priest and undergo what even for them was probably a weird request or a weird thing but that God instructed them to do. But it's as if David is identifying himself with a leper who in and of himself is beyond cure and needs the miraculous intervention of an unblemished lamb. Speaking of an unblemished lamb, Another instance of hyssop being used is Passover, which we talked about recently, where as the Israelites are leaving Egypt, they are instructed to slaughter a lamb, take a, hyss a hyssop branch, dip it in the lamb's blood, and wipe it over the mantle of their doors, signifying that the blood of the lamb was taken instead of the firstborn child that the angel of death was going to kill. And that very night, the firstborn of all of Egypt were taken by the angel of death, while the Jews, Israelites, whose homes were sprinkled or wiped, I guess, with these hyssop branches with the blood of the lamb, they were saved. These are beautiful allusions to Jesus. Beautiful pictures. And if you haven't heard this, I want to put it very, very simply. Um, we understand that we are saved, well, at least if you've been around church, if you've read the Bible, but if, by any means, we understand now that we are saved from our sins by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Right? We are after that finished work, chronologically. Right? He's, he's back there in time. We're in 2022. 2,000 years later, right? Right? So how were people saved prior to Jesus, and how were people saved during Jesus? People who are saved today are saved by faith in what we look back to. People who were born and lived and died before Jesus were saved by faith in what they looked forward to. And people who lived in the time of Jesus were saved by what they looked to in their own present day. It's all faith. It's all looking to Jesus. And this is a powerful, beautiful picture that David may have been thinking of Passover. He may have been thinking of himself as a leper. There's very likely, I mean, David knew his Bible. He knew his history. The reference to hyssop is no coincidence. And he's pleading for God to do the heavy lifting, to create in him a clean heart. And finally, I just love this. In verse 13, David says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Point number four is that restoration is contagious. So sin is serious. Guilt is crushing. Grace is pure joy. And out of that pure joy, restoration is contagious. David is pleading we read again what leads up to verse 13. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then, after I've been made clean, after I've been made right, after I've been restored to you, O God, come. Huh, then I will teach transgressors to follow your ways, and sinners will return to you. 
So he's, he's saying, when I have been restored to you, O oh God, when I have experienced your divine grace, your love, your mercy, your favor, when I have been given what I do not deserve, out of my abundant joy, I will go and I will proclaim it to others and invite them to experience the same joy that you have given me in the salvation that you have graciously provided. And he has the faith to say, oh, and sinners will return to you. Brothers and sisters, we, and I'm speaking to you in particular, if you have been born again, if you believe that Jesus Christ has come on that cross as your substitute, if you trusted in Him as the only way to salvation, if you surrendered to Him saying, I want to follow you with all of my life, I want to submit to you as my King, that's you then I hope that a burden is on your heart to share the great joy that is yours with others. It's the most natural thing in the world. I mean, it's not as common anymore, but I want to take you back 10 years, maybe, when iPhones were brand new. The smartphones were brand new. I'm, I'm ballparking. Maybe 12, 13 years, 14, I don't know. I remember when iPhones were a brand new thing, right? And oh my goodness, when somebody got a new iPhone, this is not an iPhone, but when somebody got a new iPhone, you could not get them to shut up about it. They would tell you everything this thing could do. It's like a computer in your pocket. I mean, you can pull it out, you can get on the internet, you can zoom around, like, you can go check out home prices, you can go to uh, ultimateguitar.com and learn how to play different songs. You can do all these things. And you can download these, these things called apps. It's, I think it's like short for applications or something. And, and you can download these apps and you can listen to music. You can watch movies right here on your phone. You can watch live football on your phone. You can do all these things. It's amazing. You could not get people to shut up about how incredible this computer in their pocket was. This ought to be the joy that we have in our salvation. And God has done something so miraculous, so incredible, so much greater than anything we could ever deserve, ever imagine, that we would become these unstoppable, mouth-jabbering people about the grace and the glory of God, that He would restore sinners like me who don't deserve Him to even look my direction, and yet He has Welcome me in a warm embrace. If that sounds too warm and fuzzy, sorry. Uh, he loves you. He wants to wrap arms of love around you and accept you. And uh, we're not excited about that. Amen. I hope, I hope you are. It is my hope. It is my hope in coming weeks and months. I believe we, this last week in, in my office, I was jotting down just a whole comprehensive list of, of, of approaches of things that I hope that we can do together as a family of God to reach Carson City with the gospel. Some, some simple things like re recording a video and putting it on our website, just welcomes people to checking out Silver Hills through our website, and uh, community outreaches that we would do together, and then arming you all with greater and greater skills for one-on-one -on -one evangelism just in your daily life, and just on and on and on. But I will say, it all starts with prayer. If there are people in your life who you know to not be in a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ, I believe that you'd be praying for them. Prayer is the road to her that tills up the hardened soil so that when the gospel comes, it has a chance for the seeds to go down into the soil and give birth. And I'm not saying it's your effort. I'm saying it's the grace of God that responds. He delights to hear our prayers. He delights to respond to our prayers. We plant the seed, we water the seed, but God gives the growth, according to 1 Corinthians 3. So, I just, want to, I just want to say we have every reason to have faith that God does create in people clean hearts. 
God does restore to people the joy of their salvation. God does call people to himself. And we can pray ambitiously, believing that God will do the heavy lifting. We don't have to come up with the creative, amazing gospel presentation that will transform someone's heart. We'll never do it. But God's power is infinitely greater than ours. And he delights to draw people to himself. So, I have uh, four summary application points, we might say, to turn each of these four things that we've looked at into, like, what do we do with this? Four takeaways. I want to encourage you, confess your own sin. Make this a daily habit. Or in as often as you see it, sin in your own life, confess it. Confession is simply agreeing with God about our sin. God says that what he sees with his eyes, that's called reality. And sometimes we don't like to live in God's reality. But confession is our agreement with God about our sin. Confess to God, you have a sin nature. And you commit sinful acts. And confession is empty without repentance. Do everything within your power to turn from your sins, because faith without deeds is dead. But number two, confront your guilt, your conscience, and your standing before God. And then capture your grace. I was trying to make these all seeds, as you can tell. Confess your sin, confront your guilt, capture your grace. When you capture a bird, you put it in a cage, you don't want to open that door, right? You don't want to, you don't want to let it fly away. Hold on to God's grace by constantly thanking Him for it. And then finally, contribute your voice. Pray for God to give you opportunities to share the gospel with others, to share the good news. He does delight to do this. But it also is a habit for us to build. And it's amazing in my life, I'll just be transparent, when I've been in seasons where I'm frequently sharing my faith, it's amazing how often I see opportunities to share my faith more. But then when I go spans of not talking to people about my faith, it's amazing how rarely I see opportunities to share my faith. You get what I'm saying? Like, the more we do it, the more we see opportunities to do it. And so the hardest thing is to get the ball rolling. But, you know, inertia, right? Laws of motion. Like, once it's moving, it's so much easier to keep it moving. So confess your sin, confront your guilt, capture your grace, and contribute your voice. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that your grace meets us where we are as broken, failing, filthy sinners. And, and we don't even have to hide from the reality of how messed up we are. We know it. We know we are utterly messed up. And yet you accept us. And you offer to transform us. So God, please give us the faith to trust you through the process of being transformed. Through the process of keep pouring out faith into our hearts. You are the author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, help us to see you as you are. Help give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And not just for the sake of our own salvations, as if this is all about being blessed. But Lord, help us also to be determined to bless others with the great joy that is ours. Like a new iPhone user or a person who has just purchased a new car, who's geeked out about all the features, Lord, help our spirits to be geeked out about our Savior. You are worthy of all of our praise, God. Thank you. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for adoption. We talked about it in uh, Sunday school this morning. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for loving us and promising us infinite glory in heaven. 
Not just the mansions, not just the sea of glass, not just the golden streets, but God, your very presence without fear because there is no more sin in our hearts. To be able to stand on those golden streets with you without terror, without shame, because you have washed us thoroughly and finally. God, we look forward to that day when sin is just a memory, a distant one at that. And all that is left is pure joy. We pray this in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.
opportunities to experience the joy of your salvation. Lord, even the fresh air that we breathe and the flowers that we see, all of the beauty around us is uh, a gift of your grace. Lord, help us to appreciate every single thing you give us. And we thank you here and now that you are the Father in heaven who gives us every good thing that comes down from you, Lord. And help us to enjoy our friendships and relationships with one another. I pray that this church would be growing in fellowship with each other, that we would get to know each other better and better, uh, that we'd be salt and light to one another, that we'd be encouragement to one another, iron sharpening iron, everything your body is called and meant to be, for your glory and for our joy. We pray this in your holy and beautiful name.